Welcome back. This is episode number 26. Let's go. The SMX finale this last weekend. Let's go, Las Vegas. Oh, my God, dude. I can't (laughs) believe it's over, honestly. I know. 31 rounds. It feels like it took forever, but it also went by in a flash. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad that it's over for... Some of the guys, but then some of the guys even are planning on going to Australia, going to European rounds, and MX of Nations. Mm. We're going to get into all of that, but my favorite part of the night. You want to hear my favorite part of the night? Yeah, let me hear it. Crikey, mate, you know, I just want a big shout out to Chase Sexton, bro. Heal up quick, man, and freaking Hunter. I feel so bad beating my little brother. I feel so bad. It's like, fool, you just want a million dollars. You don't give a fuck about your brother. Get the (laughs) fuck out of here, dog. You don't care about Chase. And it's his big brother. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean, (laughs) big brother. But still, like, come on, bro. Give me a podium speech. Like, the first thing you say out of your mouth. I mean, I get it. I respect your, you know, your rivals and whatever. (laughs) But, like, dude, you just want a million dollars. You don't care that Chase went out that much, and you don't care that you beat your big brother that much either, right? I think he does. Because, like, what is left for Jet other than competition? Bro, it's just going to— That's true. You know, what's left for him? Like, he is conquering it. Well, you know what that is right there? That's a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about first with a very special guest, one of the best— motocross racers ever to do it legendary in the sport has changed the way we look at technique has changed the way riders think about riding has given you an alternate perspective of how to look at the sport of motocross and supercross in a whole give a round of applause welcome ryan hughes on the show What's happening, my boys? What's, happening? <laughs> What's I'm up? Glad to be on, so I can say, I saw one of your guys' shows, and I was like, "Man, I think I need to be on one of those. I need to, be one of those. I like, I need to speak. I need to talk." You know. And then I think we were answering back and forth on Instagram. So yep. yeah, hell yeah, yep. cool. Good. So so what did yeah. you what did you think about Jet like coming off winning the SMX championship, winning a million dollars, and the first thing he says is, "I feel bad for Chase." And I feel bad for beating my big brother. Um, you know, see, that's where I don't pay attention to the sport. I don't give a fuck what they say. How Thank do you ride you. a motorcycle? Thank how do you ride you. a motorcycle? That's all I look at. That's all I watch is how you ride a motorcycle. Because, again, these guys are different on camera, different on the podium. Because to say this, can't say that. Um, you're a robot also. You're a complete robot. And there's... And there's these guys it's just there's no way to be at that top level like you guys were saying 31 weekends at a 51 after 52 and not be such a robot that nothing gets to you so then you start to talk that way because i'd go back and watch some of my interviews and i'm like fuck bro i was bored you know know, but it's just like this just zoned in this zone and as you guys know because you're professionals also it's like it's like almost takes some time to come out of this trance you know what i mean and because people don't understand how fast things are happening when those guys are on the motorcycle with a track that's continually continually changing see most things they're watching what's popular now is formula one well yes something can change the grip level nothing else See, motocross, so much shit can change, different obstacles and variables and things that way. And going at that speed, as you guys know, I think it kind of takes a little bit time to get out of that trance. So you talk kind of just, you don't even know what you're really saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just pay attention to the writing. And for him to come off the couch, and I know he had preparation, but this just shows how phenomenal he is, but also how strong his mind is. So you'll get a very phenomenal rider, a good rider, but their mind is a little bit weak. You'll get another rider that's mind's very strong, but then their technique and approach isn't very good. You know, so it's to have that well-rounded of a rider is, is pretty inspiring. And then you got another guy just right behind him, Deegan with that same mindset, same technique, same, same approach. I mean, both of them, both those guys have the best techniques on the track bar, you know, by, you know, I mean, not by far, but, 
little things like there's no mistake in their technique yeah. if we wanted to break well, them down to well rhino A-Z. it is it is by far because nowadays we're working with tents right excuse me i said nowadays we're working with tents to me deegan yeah. and jet are by far faster and better at technique than the other riders it just doesn't look by far because that big gap is really only you know a half a second yeah it's a half a second here half a second there half a second half a second then you lose then you lose second place loses loses the uh, view on first then it goes to a second a lap because now he's looking back at third you know what i mean you kind of see how that happens but see there's just little things like you'll never see deegan round his back you'll never see jet round his you know tuck his butt you'll never see their knees bend in front of their shoulders they're always bending in that strong you know from the hips out and when they come into stuff they open up they don't close down you never see their arms close down you know what i mean so they're allowing their body to be in positions to go faster be more efficient and get away with more because of this you know kind of positioning they're putting themselves in and you can't deny it because how how important is the setup of the motorcycle that thing has to be so balanced to ride at that level so what why shouldn't the the mechanism that's riding it have to be in that same idea in the best opposite, you know, possible position to be in to go that speed. Yes, right. But you know, that that's why I'm so fanatical about it because just these two guys just show what that perfect kind of positioning can do because they're a little bit of heads and shoulders above everybody right now. And just to add on that, I don't think I don't think the level of technique we are seeing has always been there. And it's just now coming in we're into this 21st century where technique is now combining with natural talent on the motorcycle, natural, you know, aggression and the mental capacity to twist the throttle and to go that fast, matching it with the commitment of technique and the right technique a hundred percent of the time. Like, you know, I mean, not to bag on James Stewart or Ricky Carmichael, like, Dude, they were the best in the world, but when you even go back and look at their film, a lot of those guys would just twist the throttle hard and have really good technique some areas, but they would lack in some areas because they were so out of control all the time. And I feel like now with Deegan, with Jet Lawrence, and I'll even put Chase Sexy in that category, Hunter Lawrence in that category, and there's a few others that have that perfect technique where – you're kind of seeing that perfect combination of 21st century motocross kind of coming forward and that technique following because it wasn't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Rhino, like there's some really fast kids out there that don't have good technique. Yeah. So if you do, if you wrap up the say it's like, okay, so Stuart and Stuart and those and Carmichael is 2008, 2007, 2009 or yeah. whatever, right in there, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I started really coaching this technique in 2010. I have a DVD that of the same exact thing that everybody's coaching and teaching and writing like back in 2010 yeah. and starts the same thing. So I started coaching this for 2010 on. So I, you know, I feel that my, kind of my dedication to the sport of teaching and seeing something that I don't know how I saw it, but just, it came to me. I started teaching this, you know, this technique. And, but now when more people, more, you hear about it more and more and more, you're going to start focusing on something more and more and more. So like with Stuart and Carmichael, they didn't, they rode more flat footed. They didn't ride on their toes. So you get to a Villapoto, Villapoto rode so much on his toes and gripped so much with his feet. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But Carmichael and Carmichael and Stewart had their hips out back straight more than anybody, Mm -hmm. more than anybody, more than anybody. They wouldn't have been Carmichael or Stewart if they didn't have their hips out, you know, rotated out as much as they did and their back is straight. Impossible. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because of what they got away with because the motorcycles weren't as good back then. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and it's just, it's just, it's just a, the right, it's not, these riders are better than Carmichael and Stewart or, or Ricky or Johnson and Bailey and all that. You know, everybody, if Bailey and Johnson are racing right now, they'd still be in the same spot. You know, it's just because it's a mentality. But it's just everything has progressed so much that now these guys are being so, you know, the speeds are so much higher and, and things are being more precise because of so many things belong to it. 
but again, you can have the best setup motorcycle. You can have the fittest fucking rider ever. You can have the cleanest thinking <laughs> guy in the world. But if your technique isn't sound, because your speed is only good as your technique allows. When mm-hmm. your speed's too fast for your technique to handle, what happens? You tighten up, be hesitant, and then you start making mistakes and you know bobbles and crashes. So yep. the more sound your technique is, the faster you can go. Just like the more set up your <clears throat> motorcycle is, the faster you can ride it because you're more comfortable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Mm-hmm. And so that's where it is, is that these guys just don't do a couple things. Like you look at a kitchen. Yeah, he goes fast, but he has a big t- butt tuck. He tucks yep. his butt a lot. Mm-hmm. So now that back end will come around. Now that front end will tuck. Now, you know what I mean? Because your bike has separation in it from front to rear. Yeah. Well, the body on top of it has to have the same thing. You have to have kind of your from hips to feet for the back end of your motorcycle, hips to head for your front of the motorcycle. You have to have some separation there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. You can't you can't be doing something opposite of the bike or you're always going to be counterbalancing it. And that's where you see him off balance a little bit. And again, he should be a little bit more consistent with that speed, which he's not, which Deegan is. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, but the and, big thing, Rhino, like something that we like to do on track talkers, we talk about it all the time is like we know Levi Kitchen tanked it this weekend. And me, you, Ty, we've all seen Levi Kitchen ride. He, we know he tucks his ass yeah. underneath. We, and, he, and he gets tired, too. For some reason, like, I see Levi Kitchen, and one weekend, he'll be up, stout, ass out, hips out, fucking shoulders square. Everything looks super sweet. Then, all of a sudden, he's struggling, and he doesn't like the bike setup. He doesn't like something going on. And you see that tall, lanky elbows, they'll drop. The butt will tuck in. But, like... From an yep. outsider, I mean, you see the same thing with you see the same thing with Plessinger. Yes, you know, yes. Same thing oh, like a little he's, floppy, sloppy. He's even floppy, worse. Sloppy. He came off the two fifty F, and you can be a little bit more floppy, sloppy on that, especially if you're a big kid, a big guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you get to the four fifty, now again, more power, more weight, more speed. Well, now you need to be more precise with your technique. So you see, um, you know, Plessinger become a little bit more precise with this technique now and not be so floppy sloppy but like you guys do say when you're uncomfortable you know what what happens you get a little bit fearful right mm-hmm. you get a little bit hesitant well what happens when you yell at your dog it tucks his butt yeah. <laughs> yeah. so sure whenever, whenever you're a little bit scared you tuck your ass you know when your uh-huh. dad is going to come whoop your ass <laughs> what do you do oh shit yeah right? yep. <laughs> well so, so let's let's talk about this then this is kind of the point i was yep. trying to make is like yeah so what the fuck does what does plessinger what would you tell them? What would you tell them to do well, to Plessinger and Levi Kitchen? How do they fix that? Because they're both so fucking fast on so yeah. many different occasions. <laughs> but, you know, like one of the things we like to do on the podcast is put out some positivity. We dog on these yeah. guys all day. And, yeah, I've done it. You've done it at a whole different level than I've done it. But, like, I want to make sure that we're putting out help and not only for these guys but for the people watching the show. So, like— what yeah. what can they do? What where do you start? I mean, do we just go back to the basics, slow it down? Levi Kitchen just needs to work on off season hip structure all year, or is this more of a mental thing? No, I would the, the first thing to do is that you cannot you cannot do anything until you you learn to feel it. And you can't recreate anything until you feel it. So, mm-hmm. and usually you got you got to slow down to feel something. So, what I would do if these guys came to me, same thing I did with Austin, all that, is that beginning of the year, say, okay, let's let's ride some easy tracks, some easy stuff, and I want you to feel something. I want you to feel what I'm getting at, not try to understand it and not try to doubt it. Just just feel it. And so, I'd have them ride in a position and go through things and do drills and things in this position in this position but at a slow pace and go what did you feel well man i felt it left off my arms i felt like i could turn the bike here you know i didn't have Mm -hmm. to pull up blah 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 and i said okay so that felt good right and he goes yeah all right so now what do we do we chase that feeling so if that felt good here and that good there that should be feeling good when you get on the supercross track now is that going to happen overnight no so you need someone in your corner that is constantly fucking reminding you every <laughs> lap yeah. on your toes hips out back straight on your toes hips out back straight on your toes hips out back straight the whole fucking time and that's what i do with my riders and that's why i've changed them all so fast is that it's 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 constant reminders i'm sitting on this part of the track this part of the track i'm showing them, i'm talking about them i come in I talk about it. Hey, when you went in that corner, you tucked a little bit and you felt that back end come around, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the next lap, you came out and your hips were, your hips were out and you tracked perfectly and kept that slide, didn't you? Yeah, you did. 
you know? So it's like, you have to kind of, you have to reteach them, but they have to do it from a feel, Yeah. you yeah. know? And most people can't, most people can't identify and look at it like that. So that's why, you know, it kind of does blow me away that nobody hires me. You know, it really fucking does blow me away. I'm well, sorry to say it. Yeah, you know, no, whatever, but you look, might think I'm crazy. You might think, yeah, but nobody hangs out with me. So anyways, yeah, but but if I can get anybody the on, in the world, I can fix their, their, their imbalances. This is what's the problem with the trainers these days is that they keep working on strengths. I go in and I look at your imbalances. I look at your weaknesses and we start there. I don't give a fuck about motos. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about fitness. I don't give a fuck about speed because I'm going to get you more fit faster and more efficient by fixing this weakness than trying to better you in all the places that you already train and yeah. that you already do it. You but, know what I mean? Yeah, I I 100% agree with you on that. And I think a lot of riders overlook that. But let's go back to the big problem. And this is something that I've learned with the riders that I kind of grew up with. And now that I've retired, I'm seeing it a little bit more and more and more. These kids are really becoming stars. There's more money involved. There's more stardom. The social media has made them more of icons. So now they're looking at other people and they're kind of thinking like, oh, you know, what do you know? I'm better than you. I'm this icon. I've gotten here. Why should I listen to you? And that comes back to even some of the kids that I've trained before. How do you get a rider to accept that because that's one of the biggest things in my eyes when you see a rider that not only is getting trained but is believing and accepting the training as far as like yes this is what i'm gonna do this is gonna work i accept you i put my trust in you how do you get these riders to do that that's the issue right on the professional level yes on a professional yeah. level well, one is getting getting the right person. Two is possibly getting an intelligent kid, you know, because he's able to listen. He's able to kind of like ponder on it and go, OK, that makes sense. You know, and then also, you know, you should know somebody's some somebody's pedigree and background. Right. Yeah. To me, sometimes these people training with moms and stuff like that. I'm just like, OK, OK. Yeah. But they don't know that 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 they don't know that pristine level they mm -hmm. don't know that pin pinnacle level you yes. know what i mean and so if you can teach from that um and then the other thing is being able to just be able you know to make sense to them mm -hmm. make sense of what you're trying to accomplish what you're trying to get out of it you know and with explanations and things like that so um you know like deegan well who do you think coached him <laughs> who do you think yeah. trained you know I, I trained him for two years and got him to take the neck brace off and got him to take all this and that was a battle with his dad i battled with his dad for almost a year and it was just like look your kid he's not going to go any faster look how he's going into corners every time he goes into corners his knees tuck forward right he yeah. goes yeah and he, i go where's his weak part he goes entering corners and i said well then look 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 it's not the bike it's not anything i go look at what's happening when his knees go in front of his shoulders to look up and now he's getting kicked and he's getting kicked sideways and he has to push back with his arms yeah. and it took forever to do and, it. And his dad finally took it off and then boom, dude, like Hayden just went bonkers. And now you never see those knees go in front of the shoulders because again, you know, he, he, he knows where the, where he started improving, yes. you know? And, and so it's like, you gotta, I don't know. I don't know how to do it, you know, because yeah. everybody, everybody, you know, they got this ego, but mm -hmm. I guess you just got to bring some intelligence in it so that those people can just go, I get it. I get it. You know yeah, what I mean? That's, that's what that's Austin, the ego. you know, it's, Austin, we started so training big. with Austin. I took him to this, sorry, I took him to this little turn track and he's just like, what the fuck am I doing? Oh my God. <laughs> here we go again. Here we go again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And after we got done doing our drills, he's like, dude, he goes, I learned more with you in 20 minutes than I have in probably two years. And I said, there, there you go. Because yeah. what did we do? We slowed it down. We talked about it. We dissected it. And I asked you questions of how you felt. What did you mm -hmm. think? And you know what I mean? It's like, this is, that's what a coach is, not a trainer. Yes. A coach is to, is to transform you. A trainer is just to, is to, you know, fine tune you. Yeah. And then right? like to add that, on to that, like, you know how you took, you were just telling me or telling us that um, you take an Austin Forkner to a turn track you know, with no jumps, just corners, just focusing on technique. Like, I had a trainer, John Murata. He wasn't he wasn't the most educated on motocross or whatever, but yeah. he was 
the right trainer for what I needed at the right time. And I remember we lived up in the high desert and some of the best t- uh, days that I had on a bike and the most I got out of the days were the days that it would pour down rain and I would go ride a desert track, just a turn track yep. for fucking seven days straight. And I don't feel like these kids, especially growing up right now, the kids on the 85, 65s, even in the B class are riding turn tracks like we used to. And I don't well, know how The thing is, that's that why you haven't off. seen... Yeah, well, you haven't... The thing is, is because new practice tracks came around. So in my day, we didn't have any practice tracks. So when it didn't rain in California for 200 days, well, what happened? You rode on dust. Yeah. You rode on the shittiest conditions for 200 days straight. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. No, no water, no nothing, because you can't do anything about it. Now, practice tracks came in, and what what rules the sport? More vets, so they make mm-hmm. these in amateurs, so they make these tracks more easy. So these riders are going to come to a point where these tracks don't challenge them as much anymore, so they don't oh. progress as much anymore. So where's the last person, except maybe you know, except Deegan now, yeah. that's come from California that's really has dominated the sport like it was back in the '80s and '90s, where everybody came from California because our tracks were so gnarly. Yeah, our no, tracks I mean, were so gnarly out here, dude. Yeah, other you know than I mean? freaking Jet Reynolds, Ryder De Francisco, and Hayden Deegan, like that's kind of it from yeah. California. But those guys, but again, hold on, but those guys aren't Rick Johnson. They're not Brock no. Lever, not Ron Lachine. They're not Jeff Ward. They're not Johnny O'Mara. You know what I mean? They're yeah, not yeah, Jeremy they're, McGrath. Yes, they're yes. not myself. You know what I'm saying? So like Deegan, he's that level now. Yeah, and so that's all I'm saying is not against any kids, not against mm-hmm. anybody. It's just what they have to ride now they have to ride tracks that are smooth tracks Mm -hmm. that are water tracks that are groomed tracks that don't have you know death defying cliffs on the (laughs) side like we did i mean dude serious if we showed you some of the tracks we had to ride these kids 98 percent of the kids wouldn't ride oh dude i mean like a track that jeff that wardy road i rode um you know uh, even up till the time of um um uh, villa poto Yep. You know, mm-hmm. just like central and things like that. I don't know if you guys ever rode that when you're younger, but dude, like you do two motos, every knobby on your tire is gone. Yeah, we like, have a couple, you know, <laughs> yeah, we have a couple like sand riding areas that like are just OHV park areas out and kind of towards yeah. our central cow. And it's just pure sand. Yeah. And they've never gotten prepped. And dude, it was like. I've taken a couple 85 kids there probably like three or four years ago. And it was like, uh-huh. they, f- they felt like it was like the worst day of their life. And luckily yeah. I like brought my bike and it just rained. And I was like, dude, this is so much fun. Like, like you got to yeah. enjoy the suck and those rough tracks because if you can enjoy that shit, like it's, I think yeah. it's one of the best times you will ever ride on a dirt bike with no jumps and just, you know, creating your own line and being creative on kickers yeah. and yeah, you know, sand rollers and well, you learn, stuff you like learn, that. you learn, you learn the, you learn the motorcycle. You mm-hmm. know what you what what doesn't challenge you doesn't progress you. Yeah, right. So if you're riding tracks that aren't really challenging you because you go there three times a week, well, you know, you're only you're going to come to a certain point. It's like a boxer, MMA guy, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, always fighting people his level. No, he's always he's going to try to spar with people better than him so that he can get a little bit better, a little faster, a little quicker, learn tricks. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so it's the same thing with motocross is like, hey, get off that easy motocross track, go trail ride and go, mm-hmm. you know, go do different things, do do a lot of turn tracks, do some squares, do, you know, work on your skills and what surprises me is that how many people have so little control of the controls that are controlling the motorcycle? Like they don't have good feel with the front brake or the, the clutch or the gas. You know, there's no yeah. there's no feel to it. You know, there's yeah. no oneness with it. And they just and that that is like lacking. So for me, it's like everybody slow down because if you cannot do it fast, you never. I mean, if you can't do it slow, you're never going to do it fast. So mm-hmm. if you want to learn new, if you want to be more you know, precise, if you want to always progress, then don't, it's not always output. Sometimes it's input, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why even by slowing your riding down a little bit, Hey, you don't always have to be the fastest guy at the track. And that was my mistake. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I'm going to be the fastest guy ever. Always, always, <laughs> always, always. But it's like, but then Jeremy and Jeff were like, they're more methodical, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and so they had a little, you know, a much better career than I did, but they were more precise with their stuff, even I was probably faster and fitter, but their technique and approach was so much more probably consistent. You yeah, know, but that's they would why. Slow down and stuff. Yeah, but that's why I kind of you know, disagree. I really feel it's important for. That's why I disagree with disagree. you guys, though, because like 
it not wholeheartedly, but I I disagree in the fact that it doesn't have to be this gnarly desert track to get it done. I really don't. And I know that's like the old school way. And that's how Tyler was too, right now. He was just like, I have to yeah. fucking go do the gnarliest shit ever. <laughs> You know, and that's I loved it, though. yeah, and that's what Ty yeah. did. But at the same time, you know, to me, I know this is fucked up, and take it how you want it, audience. But dude, it just comes down to if you don't got the talent, and the kid doesn't want to fucking do it, yeah. it's just not gonna happen. Because I hated riding rough tracks, and I wasn't ever a Ryan Hughes, but I did it a total opposite way of Tyler did it. You know, but I loved yeah, riding yeah. my dirt bike. I loved doing the technique shit. I fucking loved hitting the whoops all the time. I just wanted to do lap after lap after lap. But I also loved a really tacky fucking track. Like, I just didn't yeah, like so rough tracks because they were so fucking dry. I mean, I did ride them, yeah. but I, I didn't necessarily love them. <laughs> Well, so if you guys would have, if you guys would have angled together and made one of you guys, then maybe you would have had the. <laughs> it it would have been. And we because, say that all the time. <laughs> no, because the thing is, is that so the track that I have at the bottom of my track, I I used to ride back in the day, and it was it's super super rough, and so I remember uh, practicing for Millville myself and Jeff were out here in '97, and '97 um, '98 whatever it was, and we're doing motos, you know, 30 minute motos, summertime, hot as shit, rough as shit, mm -hmm. and we're pounding, and he he pulls in 20 minute mark, and off the first moto, and I finish mine, I come in, I go, he's loading his bike, I go, hey, what happened? You bike break? He goes, nah, just not feeling it, not feeling it. Um, I'm going, I'm going to star West and star West was even easier than it was before they took, got rid of it. You know what wow. I mean? Like yeah. a little vet, vet track. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So Millville's this week and he's going to star West. Okay. Yeah. I go, dude, that's yeah. I, I <laughs> yeah, get, it. Hell I get yeah. it. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Go to star West, dude. I busted out of 40, right? I'm, yep. I'm, I'm smashing this fucker this weekend, smashing him. We go to Millville. He goes one, one, I go two, two. So <laughs> There's, 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 there's that guy that you need to do that stuff. You mm -hmm. need to do the things you don't like, but then there's also the guy that needs to really focus on the technique and approach. So yeah. like I say, if you mended your two guys together, that, um, and that's, you, know, you would have had that, that guy, you, you know, you know who that is to a T fucking Ken Roxon. It Kenny could think to the time that I've spent around Kenny, if Kenny mm -hmm. thought he needed to eat three pancakes with butter on them, before the fucking mm -hmm. race, 20 minutes, that fucker would go win. He is yeah. so, he is so like that. If he thinks that he needs to ride a smooth track, you better get that fucking guy on a smooth track because then he'll go do it. You know, where it seems yeah. like to me, Eli Tomac is the type of guy where if you, if he goes out and works hard and rides the roughest shit and does the gnarliest shit, that will satisfy his mental craving of success to feel like he's ready to go. But that's the thing is that people don't realize his track's smooth. He hasn't, he didn't, and for six years, he did not change a bump or a turn on his outdoor track. <laughs> and that's the only outdoor track he ever rides. For really? six years, I'm like, I'm like, dude, I go, how did you, I go, how did you do that? And he goes, did it work? I'm like, <laughs> you, got me there, buddy. you got me there. <laughs> you got me there. You know? But Did it work? Serious, like, yep. Not a, not a not a bump or not a bump. I mean like not a jump or a turn. He didn't change for six years. <laughs> Same track, and he's the only one that rides it. He's the only one that rides it, and that's the only track he ever rides. Oh my and dude, god. So it's not and again, he's not Eli's not like a hard, hard trainer. He's just a very consistent guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? He yeah. does his work, and then also he's not taken off by to me doesn't seem like a lot of california florida things whatever it is you know he, yeah. and also you know he lives at altitude he, he lives mm -hmm. at ten thousand feet or that whatever you helps. know eight thousand feet so that helps i don't give a shit what you say especially when you're you know? born there and yeah then, yeah and know, also you know like... and you're and you're in nature and mm -hmm. all this different stuff it's it's condif completely different than you know living in track houses okay okay and, so and what is the and all this what does the nature part of it do for him well, it's just because again, you're not again. Now you go into a you go into a neighborhood, you go into an apartment building, you go into a condo. How much smart everything is there? Smart phones, smart refrigerators, smart toilets, smart this, smart this, smart, smart, smart. Yep. Well, those are radio waves. You know, those are those those are going to have an effect on you. How many people have five? You know, how many people have five G out there? Yeah. How many people have you know their internet on? All these. And it's just like whoa. 
you know, and then the noise and the, and the cars and the, and it's just different when you get into nature, then you start to kind of pay attention to the rhythm. You start to get into a rhythm, Mm -hmm. you know, Yep. if that makes sense, because again, you cannot deny science and I'm not being some hippy dippy guy, but you just can't deny science dude. and how much better it feels when you're outside, you know, training and and breathing and, and even walking on the ground with no shoes on, not to meaning anything, but just, just living that way. You know, and and you start to become so much more grounded. You start to become so much more clear, you know, and then that, that kind of that internal stress from maybe these. You're not kind of almost producing are going away. Stress of these, you know, these electronics and all these different things. Right. Yeah. So that's just, you know, what what is out there. And yeah, so I, having that, it just seems like he's you just seem like he doesn't such a more like a subtle energy than people if you get him talking about like eli's always oh, just kind of without been, a doubt you know, yeah just kind of very you never seen him get revved up Mm-mm. you've never yeah. seen him kind of act out of character <laughs> i've seen, seen it seen one time some weird look, <laughs> i've seen it you know? one time in atlanta but that was oh, it. that was with justin barsha <laughs> <laughs> yeah but 99 percent <laughs> of the time tomac is mr yeah. even keeled yes yes exactly so you know uh so i don't know this who knows what it is, but, uh, but yeah, just, I, I would have known Eli, you know, he just trained, he just trained right. Yeah. And I think that it's, it is that stuff, you know, it's the 1% here, the 1% there and all that stuff's adding up. And yeah, like if you move your ass out to some spot in the middle of fucking nowhere, that might not be your cure all, but yeah, the, the way that Tomac goes about it with his family and his dad being even killed. And I guarantee you the people around him, the people he surrounds himself with the environment that he's in, everything about Eli Tomac just screams Eli Tomac because he knows that he has to be that guy to be Eli Tomac on the track. And that's yeah. what you see. That's what you get. And I feel like, well, bring it back if to you the think racing, about it, how much, Bring yeah, it. how much do you ride during the day? You ride maybe what an hour, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, hour, hour, hour and a half. Let's just say hour, hour and a half. And you ride maybe four times a week. So like even that hour, hour and a half a day. Well, now how many? That's one hour and a half. Well, what about the you know the twenty two and a half hours after that? <laughs> so you, know, Amen. You, know, you are more Amen. you are more of your life you are more of your lifestyle than you are what on that motorcycle because now if you're if you're watching this, listening to this, eating this, you know, not sleeping here thinking this, paying mm-hmm. attention to that, you're going to become more of that than you're going to become what you do on that motorcycle for that one hour. So yeah. that's a whole nother thing yeah. too, is that he's not maybe attracting all these things that are, you know, causing him to, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of step out of that role. Yeah. Right. Of this, that, that, that day in, day out, day in, day out. I'm like, you got to be a robot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, so I just I've noticed that because I've trained a lot of kids, a lot of people, and it's more there's a lot of their lifestyle that's causing them problems than just riding on the motorcycle. You yeah. know? No, I got and you. I would say I would say probably eighty percent of the problems that people have is coming from their lifestyle than not than on the motorcycle. It might be more. Guaranteed. It might be more. Guaranteed for these riders racing right now, the top guys. Like if you took their, if I could take their life lifestyle and pick it apart, I'd probably, it's 80% of their problems probably coming from that. Yeah. My you know? mental yeah. coach, when I was working with my mental coach and I've said this multiple times, um, what well, he, the more I fixed during my sleep schedule, during, you know, finishing every single dish, picking up every single thing and not leaving little things. Like when I make breakfast yeah. in the morning, you put away all the dishes and you completely finish everything. And then you wake up at a certain time and you have that disciplinary action of like, if I said I was going to do it at six, I'm going to do it right at six, not a minute before and not a minute after. And it's crazy how much of a change that happened in my writing from that. Yeah. It's routine. It's routine. Cause you got to think about the, the mind is un, you know, is uncontrollable. It's like everybody goes, I have control of my mind. Do you? What's your next thought? <laughs> yeah. you know, they can tell you what your next thought is. So if you can't tell yourself your next thought, then that means you don't have control of it. So it's kind of like a, it's a wandering wonder, right? Yeah. But yeah. your body, your yeah. body's a mechanism. Your body's like, you know, more 
So it needs it needs routine. And when you can give yourself routine, but you wake up at this time, you get the drink at this time, you go on a walk at this time, you see the sun come up at this time, you know, you know, especially in the morning, because now you're getting your body and your mind, this is this mechanism kind of in, in balance. And every single day you do the same thing. Well, if something goes off during the day, you can kind of pinpoint more, but if you're going to sleep at this time and waking up at this time and eating this and drinking this and not doing this, well, then you don't know what's kind of causing maybe your irritation or your laziness or whatever's coming out of you. Right. Yeah. So it's very important to get into a routine. And when you can get into a routine, then you start becoming a lot more consistent because how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm. So if you wake up in the morning with this routine, well, your day is usually going to follow that energy rating, right? And that's what it, it should be. You should start your day all about somebody else, all about you, because everything that you do through the day is coming out of you. So things can be sacrificed and maybe not looked at and maybe not handled well because you're not feeling well, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're a product of your environment. So, you know, so if you can find in yourself in the morning with routine, then usually your day is so much more productive and consistent because you're starting out on like, like they say, the right foot. Yep. Yeah, no, you know? I got you. And then yeah, staying on the Eli Tomac subject, I don't know if you heard, but Eli Tomac is in for MX and Nation. <clears throat> and I don't know why, but I feel like the last probably like three or four years, the MX and Nation team has, I don't know, when the, everybody's picking the team, it almost seems like, almost a burden to go and when you were on it and you know back when ricky carmichael and we had the dream team with ricky carmichael ryan villapoto and um james stewart like i thought it was just like such a privilege for those guys to pick but now that i'm getting older and older and finding a little bit more about like what takes it into going to mx nation all the work like is it ever going to get back to a place where like people are like super stoked to go like obviously Aaron Plessinger's you know really stoked to go but then you know the other two spots you know the 250 is always kind of like a wishy-washy spot if kids are going to go or not and then now we got Eli Tomac going so we have a pretty good team but I mean how do you feel when you got picked to go for MX Nations and you know ride for the USA um, well, it was always my dream to go because when I grew up, you know, the donations was huge. RJ and Bailey and Wardy and mm-hmm. Glover and Lachine. I would just be like, oh, my God, just blown away. And the stripes on the helmet. Yeah. You know, it was just like that was just I mean, I just stared at photos and stared at photos <laughs> and watched videos and just like, you know, it was like my porn. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I just I was just obsessed with it. And so. In 95, I rode 125s all year, and LaRocco was supposed to go, and he broke his wrist. So they asked me, hey, the Kawasaki's already going, and hey, you want to race the, the Nations? I said, hell yeah, I'm racing the Nations. They said, well, you got to ride the 500 class. And I said, I don't care. You know? So we went there, and yeah, I almost won my class. I went 2-2 on it, um, and we got second. But that was a privilege. The next time yeah. they asked me was in 2000 and we won it, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I was supposed to go in 96 and then also 2000, 2001 supposed to go, but then nine 11 happened. Yeah. I think, yeah. And we didn't go. And then 2003, I went again and went second. So anytime that they picked me, I was, I was up for it. And even 2000, they put me in the 500 class on a 252 stroke. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I won my and I won the class. So I went first in my class. Ricky got second in his class and then Pastrana got second in his class, yeah. you know, and we won the nation's end. Then the next time I rode 125 all year and they put me on a 450, <laughs> you know, I did nations. But I was just like, I don't care. dude. I yeah. don't care. Yeah, I just give me my fucking wanna, bike, bro. I, 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 yeah. I want to race this race because I wanted to represent the United States. So mm-hmm. that's the thing. It's like. I understand now that we have 31 races and the season's going longer and this and that. And also how Europe kind of, I think, did it to us is like they knew when our donation, our nationals was over. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they put the donations a month later. So anybody that's actually good is going to be riding Supercross that whole time Mm -hmm. and then have to jump back to outdoors you know what I mean? It was yeah. almost like yeah, we never a tough, could tough really schedule. It was it was a big gap in, in not racing for a mm-hmm. month too. It's like putting a racehorse in a stable mm-hmm. and not racing it and saying, "Okay, come out and get on your time." Yeah, right. Exactly. And so it's almost like that. But now that it's so close, so many more races, everybody's just like, "Holy shit, dude! Really?" 
yeah. you know, but I think Eli's going good for it because he's like, Hey, you know what? I'm starting to get my groove. I'm mm-hmm. starting to feel this energy. I didn't race in, I didn't race all the nationals. So he's still not completely worn out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, and yeah, so I applaud these guys that weren't going to go and now are going and that's yeah. Webb and, and, um, and, Tomac. um, Tomac, you know, I applaud them, you know, yeah. you know, it's going to be a kick-ass team. It's going to be a kick-ass team and it's going to be a literally a star, you know, star team. Well, um, star and then Aaron not, not, not star, yeah. not a star Yamaha team. I'm just saying a star yeah. team. Like, oh yeah. It's not just Got some you. rookie, yes. like, like Chance Hymas, Chance Hymas, he's not a star. He's a rookie, Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. so to speak. But like Plessinger and Cooper Webb, they're all champions and they're older. And so, yeah, yeah I think it's cool, man. I dig it. I yeah, dig no, it. And I wasn't trying to take shots on any riders or anything. No. It's no. just like, you know, fucking Team USA is tight as fuck. And then, you know, I understand these guys, the last thing they want to do is get ready to go to Europe. Like, yes, you know, you're going to Europe, you're representing the country. But people don't understand if you're going to MX Nations, you are not getting an off season. The following week, yeah. you're going to be out of Supercross track testing for the 2025 season and trying to figure yeah. out your bike. Like, that's just how it is. I right think, now. you know, also for donations, I think you need to spice it up. Why, why do we still, why do we have this team manager that's from another country still being the team manager of, of the United yeah, States? I don't know. You I know, mean, I still we don't talked understand about that. that. I went, that's I went three times. I went three times. I went three times and he'd never told me a single freaking word of what to do. So, uh, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever. But just to me is let's, 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 let's spice it up a little bit. Hey, Roger, you got, okay, go home. Now let's get somebody that has some some yes. spite to him that's going to maybe promote it more or talk about it more or well or is that you saying that more, you, you want to I mean? is that saying that you want to be the team manager or who do you think it should I'll, be? Dude, I'll be the dude I'll be the team manager I'd rally for it all day long I'd Hell start yeah. yeah start like a rally for again because this is representing Amer- you know United States yeah if everybody's proud of their country well then why how how do you how do you like uh show your pride you yeah. show your pride through your way mm-hmm. you know your way now with motocross is is representing the country in in the uh motocross the nations you know what i mean maybe yep. somebody else that's building cars is building this car really sound because he's proud of being american you know what i mean yeah. but just like how do you how do you represent you know this country that yeah we i mean in. now that's, that you think about it it would and, be really fucking and weird but the other thing too is let's everybody let's pay attention to not allowing so much history die away yeah you know we need to keep some history in the sport you know what i mean and that's mm-hmm. a historic fucking race so let's yes that's you know to me is everybody come together and let's try to keep some history in the sport and not just everything be new 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 you know mm-hmm. what i mean Yep. Like, I think it's important. You look at F1, you look at these things, they have some tracks that are historic and they keep them there, mm-hmm. right? Like Monaco and stuff like yeah. that. So, you know, and, and so I think with the donations, if, if we just, you know, we're like, hey, man, this, 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 this uh, race has been around longer than anybody else has been in the fucking sport, actually. Yeah. I know, it's you know, crazy. even, even DeCoster, you know, mm-hmm. I think it was before he's, you know, before he started rate or got there the first time, yeah, right? Yeah. The donations were going. So what I'm saying is this this thing's been around for a long time. So I just I think it's important to keep some history and stuff, you know? Yeah, and it is a it's a little bit weird to think. Like imagine if there was a guy imagine if Ricky Carmichael was the team manager of Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or the team manager of a uh, <laughs> Belgium, you know what I mean? Yeah. It just wouldn't happen. That would be a happen. little fucking weird. Yes. You know yeah, that you it think wouldn't about happen, it. but yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's the thing is is that I don't know why nobody looks at this because again he he doesn't like he's he, not like he organizes flights and organizes this and talks to the FIM people or is in the meetings or telling the riders what to do. But that's the thing, right? Sorry, like dude. he's been the sorry. team manager ever <laughs> no, since. No, don't I say remember. sorry. This is fucking yeah. track talkers. We're just saying what it is. If people like it or don't like it, I don't know what to tell you. We're just telling you. What it is? Did Mitch Payton do it before yes. Roger? Or no? Who did it before no, Roger? nobody's. No, Roger's been doing it for like freaking 25, 30 years. Yeah, like I shit. can't even think of anybody else but <laughs> Roger. Like, why not yeah. give another guy? Like, does Roger want a vacay or like? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just like, hey, give RJ a chance. Give yeah, like, Jeremy so, a chance. Give Ricky a chance. Give, give somebody. Give Rhino like, a chance. Yeah, what the fuck? Give somebody. I mean, let's make it fun. Let's make it exciting. Let's make it where there's some some. I don't know. My Jesus, Some that's freaking what... United States of America spirit? Yeah. Like, if you yeah, don't want to American, then go put Chad Reed in there. 
Yeah. I'm putting you know, Chad in. Like, yeah. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I mean, he's Pedro practically Gonzalez American Reed, now, though. <laughs> um, no, but we said we need that. You know, we need maybe like two coaches, right? Yes, like absolutely. So like Ricky Why and Ricky not? And Ricky and James go. Yeah. Right? Ricky James Jeremy and Rhino. And Jeremy and myself go. Yeah, right? yeah Jeremy like and Rhino. Oh my God, that would be epic. Would that not be sick? The Jeremy McGrath, Ryan Hughes team. Oh, we're getting the job. <laughs> yeah, we're we fucking pick, we, W. We pick it. Yeah. Yes. You know? So I don't know. Just I, I just like I say, I like I like history. That sport, that that race has always kind of been close to my heart, and not just because I raced it. Just I just loved it. You know, just watching and. I never really thought of it. I never really thought of it that way, like as a histor as a historical thing. Because I was on historical man. There's really nothing else that's historical in our sport right now. What are we doing that's historical? There's there's not that is not even a track that we're you know maybe Southwick is a lot you know in Unadilla, but look what happened to Unadilla. They killed it. You know why not keep the grass, man? Why not keep it the way it was? That that was legendary shit. Yeah, it was legendary. Legend did that track was unbelievable when you, w- you rolled up and there was two foot uh, tall grass your first lap. Now That's you guys never wild. got to ride this. My first yeah, time no, I rode it was never. 1991. 1991 USGP support class. Dude, I took off 15 tear offs in a lap. <laughs> it wasn't roost. It was fluff. <laughs> Right. I was like, Dude, are we fucking fluff. weed whacking or are we riding dirt no, bikes? No, no, what not, the not fuck? The first, not the first lap. After the track got groomed in, the yeah. dirt was so loamy. Oh, it, it was just, just like a fluff. Oh. oh, because nobody rode it all year. Yeah. And it rained. It grew grass. And you guys know what grass tracks are like. Yep. And so now you get you get everybody, you get 40 guys riding this grass oh track God. that have to stay in these yeah. banners. Because, yeah. you know, most grass tracks, that one corner becomes like 45 foot wide. <laughs> yes. cutting, yeah. Cutting, cutting, <laughs> cutting, yeah. Cutting. Oh, you know, like you motherfuckers. The, the, the <laughs> Cheating ass son of a bitches. <laughs> Jesus. You know? Yes. So, but you get that and you get these lines and you get these bumps that have been there for for eons, you know what I mean? Because yeah. they're the same bumps, they don't grade the track. Yeah. And and they're motorcycle bumps, you know, and yeah. there's the jumps were the jumps were man the jumps were natural more, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just I don't know, that was historic. So why do we ruin that and put this unit this unadilla that nobody likes anymore? It's just like a super speedway. And yeah. that so that's all I'm getting at because there is cool stuff in our sport that does not need to needs to change. Things just need to get fine tuned. Yes, you know what I mean. Agreed. Everybody, everybody thinks everybody thinks we need change to make things better. No, sometimes we just need to fine tune things. Yeah, and a like, relationship, think, a person, a duh, a duh. You know. Mm. Yep. And I think I mean to even add on to that, like with Supercross, like I always thought, like you know, when we would go to Dallas, there would always be like a big whoop section. And, you know, when we would go to Las Vegas, we always had the speedway. And, like, I always liked tracks. They, like, I don't know, they, for a couple years, they always had historic elements. Yeah, kept that theme. And, like, why, like, why can't we have that in Supercross? You know, just because these people, these people, because the people that run it, have don't have passion for the sport back in the day people used to have passion for the sport so they would have be creative about it you know what mm-hmm. i mean now it's just became such a business yeah. that you know like pontiac supercross used to go up in the stands and come down you know mm-hmm. what i mean yep. the coliseum used yep. to go up and come down now you know it's lucky enough to ride both of them and yeah and but- yes, dallas was always big whoops and but it was always hard pack mm-hmm. blue groove you know and it's just like now all the tracks have to be this perfect dirt instead of having, you know, some tracks there in Florida, Sandy, some tracks in, in Dallas, really hard packed because it's clay there. You yeah. know, I mean, and, this is what I will say, Rhino. I know Dave Prater. I've met with Dave Prater a couple of times and I do think that he has passion for the sport. I really do. But from the outsider looking in, I think my whole issue with it and his issue as well which I'm probably going to step on some toes here too, but everybody is so uptight because of maybe something being wrong or some fucking, you know, who's going to get sued nowadays? Who's going to do this? This is going to happen. Everybody's coattails. Nobody really can have creative or be creative. It has to be so cookie cutter because there's so much fucking shit and guidelines going on. I know. Well, that yeah. whole bullshit. Yeah. I don't know, Rhino. I don't know where you stand on the what was it, the nine whoop thing? 
Like, <laughs> God, bro, you know how long my yeah. career would have been uh, if I only had nine whoops to deal with, bro? And like, no fucking dragon's backs, bro? You know oh how many God. dragon backs I had to fucking hit? Dude, I've endoed off dragon's backs <laughs> three or four fucking times trying to figure those fucking things out. Like, I never, like, bro, yeah. and that's, uh, and you know who hey, that is, hey, too? Poor, hey, hey, poor babies on your 450 <laughs> on dragon's backs. Do a 125. Ride oh, a 125 off Dragon yeah. Back. Oh, God, fuck that. You ride man. a 125 off the Dragon Back, you're fucking top tier if you make it off the top of that motherfucker, period. Dude, they used to have, they have Dragon Backs almost every race. Oh, you I... hit that top one and that bike would bog <laughs> and you do the biggest endo. Yeah, so um, the nine whoop thing I think is ridiculous. I think, you know, because again, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with better bikes, better equipment. Uh, better suspension, better, you know, more efficient riders, blah, 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 blah. So and you know who's doing getting it? getting better. Is the team managers. They're, That's who's everybody's doing it. Doing, yeah, but the thing is, it's getting better, but they're making the tracks easier now, which is causing less racing. So how about make that whoop right as close as you can to the corner? So your corner speed is what gets you up on the whoops. So if you don't come out with corner speed, there's nothing else that you can do except jump it. And if you come out as fast as you can and you get on top, you're not going to be hitting thing, those things with a lot of speed. You're going to yep. start uh, 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 mm -hmm. and start losing speed. The problem is, is when they come in with so much speed and they're carrying speed through and then something happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So I don't feel that it's how many whoops. I feel it's the the entrance and speed into them was causing was causing to be dangerous. Like two years ago, maybe yeah, two years ago at Anaheim they had one that there was kind of like a straightaway into the whoops. And how many people cartwheeled at the end of them? You yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people got hurt. And that's where yeah, when Christian Craig won the championship, like he would just just take oh, make up five seconds yes. in them, you know. But that whoop section, you guys are racing, I think, then too. Mm -hmm. And you came into it, maybe it was Anaheim 2 or whatever. And you oh, came I in never speed. fucking forget that motherfucker. I yeah, blew came Musquin's speed. goggle strap off in that bitch in the heat. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Is, <laughs> but if you can't, if you guys know when you come out of a corner right and there's a whoop right there, yes. you get to really commit and get on top. Yep. If you miss a couple, then you can start kind of huck a bucket and then start yep, jumping yep. through. And you're not going to have that endo. It's just with that overall speed is what to me causes the problem. So yeah. if you could have that and then carried those whoops out and then carried those whoops out into maybe it's like, you know, it, you know, maybe a, some doubles and triples, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, ah, da, 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 da. Then you got to kind of time three and time three. But if you can't get out of the whoops good, then you're, you know, kind of double singling, double yeah. singling. Yeah. You know, yeah. just we have to make something with different with the tracks too. Like maybe a section that has no rhyme or reason. Yes. You know what I mean? Like that some sand and then some whoops and then a, then a stair or step and then maybe a step up and into more just sand. just something that almost and, doesn't work. Yeah, just something that doesn't make sense. And so these guys have to figure it out instead of always having the 3-4, three, 3-4, four, three, four, two, three, four, yeah. three, four, on, off, on. You know, come on. Yeah. Jesus Christ. These bikes you know are too I mean? fast now. Oh, these because, bikes are bro, so they, good now and, the, the, and the riders gear, are so good. You launch 75 feet off of four feet of fucking runway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, fucking dude, gnarly. In my day, we had to sh my day we had to shift third at the face of the triple. And yeah, bro, shit's it. fucking second quarter throttle, and you hit a sixty-five foot triple, dude. It is dead ass. Yeah. For all and dude, oh. as far as hard as you could, <laughs> shift right at the face and lift up as hard as you can, and case it for fifteen laps straight. Yeah, perfect. No, serious. That was a way to do the triple, and only three of us would probably do it the whole race. Yeah, you know. Oh, well, no. well, that's a, that's a perfect <laughs> oh. segue into why this whole conversation started. So we, I posted a post on Instagram last week about, okay, is the track a piece of shit and it's unsafe for the riders, or should the riders have to learn how to race this surface? And I posted a picture of Dallas, Texas, one of the landings in the rhythm. And it looks like a dried lake bed where the 450 tires completely, like, ripped the clay, like, the hard pack off the top. It got mm -hmm. down to some clay, and then it was just huge chunks of this hard pack-looking brick. You know, and it's like, to me, my stance on it is, what the fuck, Feld? We need some good dirt. And I, and I know it doesn't have to be perfect dirt, but get some good dirt. And if you don't have good dirt, Oh, my God, look what happens in Las Vegas when you have a night race. We have to fucking learn from this shit happening. 
Dude, the dirt in Vegas is not that much better than the dirt in Texas. Yeah, but here, let, let's just step back for a second. This is, I think, not to shoot on Feld or anything, but I don't think they've looked at this angle. I don't think anybody prior to that event. Oh, they do. Went they scoped the dirt. A, made a track and wrote, ride it. No, they scope the dirt. They check the dirt at the stadiums. They check 11,000 yards of dirt. No, but they check some dirt. I know for a fact that they check the dirt before they go there. Okay, if that fact, then why did we wait for the track to get so blown out that those chuck holes in that blue groove, dude, when it gets that dry, you can't even put a tractor on it. Like, you can't fix that when it gets that dry. So if it's getting to that point, dirt works or somebody has to be like, hey, Let's fix these sections where everybody's wadding up, everybody's coming off the track, the big chuck hole right on the double, the rhythm section. Oh, and then let's do, let's just track a dozer out there where it's super hard pack and just go back and forth with the dozer, break it up a little bit, create some traction, and we should be good for 20 minutes. Yeah, but you can't do that for every section. It's too no, late. But, yeah, but there's, at the Dallas um, Super Motocross event, there was two or three sections that could have been fixed. One, the over-under jump. The jump into the sun that you couldn't see. That was super hard packed. One. The next, the what would be the following corner. So that double coming into that rhythm section and then the landing of that rhythm section. Yep. If you just fixed those two parts, I think you would have saved five or six crashes. Minimum. Minimum. And did you see the LCQ? No. Dude, the LCQ race was practically unraceable. You should have seen Dino making passes. Yeah, he did it, and he's a fantastic rider. But at what level, and this is where it kind of pisses me off, is because, yes, I know the track is bad, but we're they're going for so more money than they've ever gone for in their entire life, mm -hmm. right, in Supercross, yes. period. So these guys are willing to risk it. Mm -hmm. They're throwing every ounce of fear out the window, and it's, how do I get to the spot I need to get to? Mm -hmm. And Dino was fucking like he was on a speedway bike in some sections, and it was so slippery and sloppy, you literally, it was like following one line in the LCQ. And then the track was still that bad for the main event. If you just think forward, okay, and go, if I have this dirt with this scenario, we ride it at night. Yeah, but there's nobody that's giving him an ultimatum in doing that they're like oh hopefully that's we'll get us some good weather that's us here this is gonna change it dude <clears throat> us talking shit this podcast we know the right people i'm telling you people are watching yeah but i mean if people are watching then like when we go back to z max straight away bro i don't give a fuck if we're professional riders nobody in a competition professional race should be jumping directly into the sun with 12 ruts across the lip. Like all the lips that are going into the sun at Z max needed to be prepped and tracked before those guys even got off the race before they even got onto the track. Okay. Because that shit, I don't give a fuck <coughs> how skilled you are. You can't see through the sun and see what line you're hitting. Okay. The hardest working, hardest gnarliest motherfucker, Rhino. What's your take on this? <laughs> uh, so I see it two ways. You know, one, of course, like you're saying, you know, there's danger. Maybe people weren't thinking about the time because, again, yes, you do have to have a day race. You know, to make this thing look a little bit more spectacular than it is. You know, one at night, one during the day, this and that. So again, you have one during the day. Uh, maybe you're not thinking about, you know, the sun. One, your mistake. Two, it's Texas, so you're going to have clay. Three, it was 100 degrees, and you're so you're going to have um, conditions that will not hold water. And so that that's called motocross to me. That That's what happens when you show up at Daytona. Sometimes Daytona can rain like, right? Well, yep, what are you going to do? Absolutely. You know, complain and take all, this, take all the mud off? You can't. It's impossible. It's impossible. That's what you have to show up. So, and why do we have a championship? We have a championship. So we have 16 different races and 16 different races should have some different scenarios and conditions and dirt stuff and textures and like this to make it where it's like, has, it tests everybody. 
tests everybody yeah. just like formula one has you know grand prix circuits street circuits monaco you know there's kind of like a test for everybody that way and so i feel that yeah some things like maybe jumping in the sun but the hard pack the blue groove the the, the g out the this and that this is called motocross man and this is why we have fifty thousand dollars suspension on our bikes and this is why we train every day and this is why we're skilled and this is why we're masters of our craft is to be able to deal with that change a line or adapt to whatever this is by a different way of riding, you know, cause when it gets slippery, you guys got to start shifting early, riding a higher gear, you know, roll that clutch on, not use that front brake, get up front a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So when everything is just smooth and perfect, there's not really, it's just like a big freight train a lot. Right. Yeah. But and so Rhino, I see it two different ways. I see it that is dangerous, you know, the sun stuff, but conditions I've always, you know, I've always liked just kind of, like let it get gnarly because that's when the best racing starts to happen because then there's mistakes you know what i mean mm-hmm. and you know so I, I see it a little bit differently but kind of this you know in some in some spots you know yeah so, that's yeah. just my perspective yeah but like because honest, again when every time we went to dallas it was blue groove every time we went to vegas it was blue groove every time you go to uh, southwick it's sandy mm-hmm. so you know what i mean it's kind of like well hey where do you draw yeah. the where do you draw the line though? Because like I know I've put myself in this situation and you've probably put yourself in this situation where you're a little bit tired, you don't give a fuck about technique, you're in a race scenario, and you're pushing and you kind of let your ego take over and you're not thinking the clear list clearest, and you just go for it anyway because you want to keep that position. I mean, and you're not your gonna, and you're not gonna let that motherfucker <laughs> pass you because well, I guess, you got I guess, him. I guess, I guess, we, I guess we, we rewind this quite a bit and just make sure that you never have to get in that position. Right. You're so tired that you can't think. But you know, but like, so now, did you you watch? Um, I'm just specifically, I've put myself in that situation. It seemed like RJ put himself in that situation. Where like he was, he was by, his back was really curled over. I don't know if he was sick, but it definitely, in my opinion, he looked tired. And then he went for that but he, jump but anyways. RJ, and RJ he was ride, offline. But, yeah, but RJ rides like he's looking tired. His arms are floppy. <laughs> I he mean, it's his true. Butt. You know, he does. He's, he's, he's all over the motorcycle. He's, he, he bends at the knees every time that he lands. He bends at the knees, and that's why he has these problems in between. Uh, you know, Jumps. sections that have ruts and G outs is because he's into his arms. Yeah. So if you bend at your knees first, you come into your arms. So if that bike does anything, you know, with the front end, well, now you're in your arms are tight. You just exaggerated it. That's why he gets flung off these motorcycles. You watch Deegan, you watch Jet. They never bend at the knees. They're always bending at the hips first. So their arms are loose. be able to withstand whatever that next jump or anything has. And mm-hmm. like, just get away with stuff. Yeah. You know what but I'm but and, here's and they do it more than anybody, you know. So to to me, RJ's issues is his technique and his technique only. Like say, if he could get somebody in his, his corner and fix his technique, I think it's he that would be way too, fitter and way faster yeah. and way more consistent. But he's at a place that only cares about fitness. Yeah. And so if you only care about fitness, you're never gonna fix people's mistakes. Where now to me, RJ has been hampered. RJ has mm been he's been he's had handcuffs on he's been suffocated from his true potential because his technique cannot handle his speed because i see myself in him yeah you know what i mean Mm -hmm. my technique couldn't handle the speed i was wanting and capable of going his technique can't handle the speed that he's probably wanting and capable of going because when he goes fast he goes fast but now why is it why is it inconsistent Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Technique. And why is there all these crashes? Well, that's what we got to look at. And that's coming from your positioning because now your positioning, you become weak in some places. And when you become weak in some places and something happens that you're not expecting, like at Z-Max, well, then boom, things happen, you know, so fast. Mm-hmm. Where Deegan and Jet can get away with the front end flicking and a back end coming around because they're so stretched out on the motorcycle and in a strong, stable, coordinated position. So everything looks dissipated. With 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 RJ, everything looks magnified. Yes. You know? Yes. That's yes. what I see yes. when I watch him. And and this is what I want to make very clear to the audience. Okay. All Rhino did right there was he seen something. And he's not sugarcoating shit. This isn't RJ so fucking fast and he has bad luck. 
I'm sick of no. people saying no. he has fucking bad luck or something <laughs> like that. Dude, there's a problem there. RJ has been yeah, doing the luck. same shit mm. for a long no. time. And no. it comes no, down because, to technique. Yeah, I'm telling you because I lived it. You know, I'm, I did, mm. everything that I teach is from what I did, what I have what, everything I teach is what I did wrong from what I did wrong and what I could have done better. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? My mm-hmm. technique, the way I went about things is not, it, I'm never teaching or talking about something I haven't experienced. I, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It has to be something I'm experiencing or have experienced to be able to talk about it because then you can talk about it with, you can talk about it with such conviction and, and be very pre- precise with it yeah. because you've experienced it. If you're just reading something and then trying to explain it, I don't think that you can be very, you know, convincing that way because you're taking somebody else's story or knowledge. Yes. That yes. makes sense. Oh, so absolutely. when it comes from your experience, then you can be so much more precise with it. And so I see that in myself because that was a thing with Jeremy and Jeff. They worked more on technique, more on efficiency, even like a Damon Huffman was more technical, mm-hmm. but I was faster and fitter and stronger and more determined and more fuck you, which I see R- RJ, but that only can go so far yep. when your technique can't handle any more speed. And when you have a competition right? like Deegan. Yeah. Yeah. When you have somebody doing it right. Yeah. You know, and you, you have somebody it, doing I it mean, right. And somebody doing it right that has a work ethic. Somebody doing it right that has a strong mind. Somebody that's doing it right that, uh, you know, that is that is big and strong. Well, dude, you better start fixing some problems and not just mm-hmm. keep bettering that, you know, your heart rate, you know, on your on your on your on your heart rate monitor because you wear it even when you take a poop. You know, yeah. these kids that just wear the heart rate monitors everywhere. I'm like, come on, man. Yeah. You're, you're still 16th. You know what I mean? Like, let's let's take the heart rate monitor off. And let's focus on some real shit. Yeah. Like, how are you riding this motorcycle? What? The, where's your mind at? Let's look at your lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know? Not just one molecule of it of your heart rate. Yeah. And that's and- where, to me, the sport goes wrong. And they miss a lot of people's development is because, you know, they're 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 narrowing it down too much to one thing because that's what worked in the past. But that's not you got to create you got to create an athlete not just a racer nowadays you know yeah. if that makes sense and that and that's not us ripping on RJ Hampshire that's no, us no, being it's, constructive it's, it's, and wanting to see him get better we fucking love yeah, RJ I, RJ's no, one of my RJ's, favorite RJ's riders it's, yeah it's not that it's just what the thing is it's just it's just truth yeah. yes and people will think truth these days is talking shit Right. Oh my God. But if you hey, can back man. it up, if you can back it up, it's not talking shit. And if you, you know, and it's not, or it's not bragging if you can back it up. So to say, but so again, you know, and if anybody wants to test it, if anybody wants to challenge it or whatever, then let me have a day with RJ and I will show you what I, what, what, what would happen. Yeah. I will blow your, I would blow his mind. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <You> know, <laughs> yep. Straight up. Right. Yeah. Because we would look at things that he never looked at. And I would be able to bring up scenarios that he'd be go, holy shit. And then I would put I would put him in positions on the motorcycle and things that show him how weak he truly is. You know what I mean? It's like, duh. And this is where Eldon and these things are going wrong nowadays is that it's still too much this 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 heart rate training thing, which motocross isn't a fitness thing as much as it was. I think back in the day, you know, two strokes and early four stroke days, two strokes, you had to override so much, just like, mm-hmm. holy shit. And then early four strokes were just beasts. So you had to hang on like crazy. But now things are like if, if you if you don't ride the motorcycles correct, then you're actually going slow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You have to ride the motorcycles correct nowadays to go to go fast because look at, you know, Jet. He does. He's not anybody that does anything wild and he's not probably, you know. But it's not his fitness that always wins. It's it's his, his precision and his and his constant traction and his constant momentum and lack of lack of mistakes is what's winning races. You know. All right. So. Well, let's talk about. I th- to me this is like the big, the big thing of the weekend, and that is Chase Sexton first lap. I think it was. I mean, I love. Do you loved, think he had earplugs in, dude? I he he. I really, for his sake, I fucking hope so. That's like the only thing I could think of that he couldn't be aware of where. Because like, there's that, no fucking way I would have not known Barsha was there. You know what I'm saying? Or assume that someone else is there. Hello. Like, yeah, he just cut just cut across the track. Yeah, like I mean, right? I mean, 
What the would, fuck? How would you ever do that on the first lap of a Supercross race, let alone in a rhythm section that you everybody's been quad quadding all day? Yeah. Like, what yeah. the fuck happened there, Rhino? Like, what's yeah. your opinion? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess with, you know, sometimes with Chase, you see some weird things, him, him do some weird things, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes maybe lack of concentration or... Yeah, I you know, know, or maybe he maybe he hits something, you know, maybe he hit like, yeah, you know, maybe. I don't know, you know, I, I don't know, you know, and that that's the thing. But this is, you know, and again, sometimes things aren't needed to be, you know, kind of like understood. It's just like, hey, this is motocross. And this is why this is why this sport is so in, incredible because of things like that. You know what I mean? And then these two guys just kind of get up and walk away and or keep racing. What I don't know what happened. But, yeah, it's, you know, some things are kind of uncontrollable when you have a track like that and so many people jumping and moving and going yeah, sideways. That's so. supercross. Or you that's just motocross. Or, or, like, or, you're just a, or you're just a dumbass, you know, or you're just a straight up dumbass. <laughs> well, I don't think that. I mean, Chase clearly isn't a dumbass. I've talked to him. I've hung no. out with him many, many times. Chase is a fucking smart kid. He knows what the fuck's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's just like, at that point, because he, and you can't make the excuse he hasn't been in that situation. He's shitty at starts. I love Chase, but he's not good at starts. And and he needed a start right there bad. And he, I mean, he wasn't even that bad. Wasn't Wasn't he like fifth or sixth? No, he was worse than that. But either way, you know, like, was this a compound from what happened last week with that interview? Like, you know, Chase Sexton last week, he finally speaks up. He finally says some real shit. He won. Shouldn't, to me, shouldn't have gotten in trouble. Okay, but clearly gets in trouble because the post got taken down. So that means somebody's yeah. fucking pissed. Yes. Like, really mad. So now... Well, KTM, KTM can't, can't say KTM can't, uh, they can't, uh, like, they're walking on thin water right now. If that makes sense, you know, you yeah. know, the stock and all that. Mm-hmm. So again, they're, you know, they can't, they can't handle any criticism, right? Any yeah. less bike sales and stuff like that, you know, they're going to have to, to me, watch their, their P's and Q's. So yeah, having somebody, your top rider saying, Hey, the bike is not good. And it's this and that it's not a, it's not a formula one car where you're talking about just the car and not the whole manufacturer or anything like that. Yes. You know, he's talking about <laughs> the KTM <laughs> motorcycles. So you know, that's why I probably had to take it down. But again, I see more of Chase kind of almost sometimes in a pan- like a little bit of panics when Jet's around. Bro, well, that's you know what, what I mean. mean. Just a lot like of a panic. So just sub- sub- subconscious panic because he's never truly beaten him. Erratic. You know what I mean? Yes. You know, yeah, kind of like he almost panics where he thinks he needs to go faster to beat him instead of just actually probably just stay on his ass to beat him because you're fitter. Yeah. And that's like what Carmichael would do. He wouldn't be as fast as Stewart, so he just sit on his ass until he tired him out, mm-hmm. and then get by him. And God damn! I hope faster. Chase listens to this and, shit. And you know, you know, Chase has got to. So that's the what I would do with if, if I was Chase. Is I would just try to sit behind him, learn from him, sit behind him, sit behind him, and just try to wear him out since you are the the, the stronger guy. Yeah, and don't you know even I mean? beat him three fucking races no, in a row. You don't need you to. You don't need to, to pass. You don't need to pass him the first. Five, ten laps, fifteen laps, or whatever it is, is just do what Jet does, kind of. You know, he gets yeah. in your pace and just kind of rests there a little bit, and then throws out a sprint. So he could kind of do the same thing to Jet, possibly. But also, you don't have to beat somebody all the time. You can just be behind him, be behind him a couple races, and then they're gonna be like, "Dude, I can't shake this guy." Yep. You know, because it, and, it and wears I don't know. on. I mean, it's, it's much, it's much easier to be said than done. Oh, absolutely. But I just see that there's a little bit of a kind of a panic sometimes of thinking that I, he needs to go faster. Because I remember, what was it Buzz Creek last year? Yeah, Buzz Creek last year. He had this amazing ride. You know, I know he did one this year too, but mm-hmm. last year he had one an amazing ride. And I remember, you know, talking to him because, you know, he was still in Honda and, and Jet was winning. And I messaged him. I said, somebody found something, didn't they? And he messaged back. He goes, you saw that? And I go, I go, that's what you look like the year before. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this, like there's just a softness in him. There's this initiation to him instead of like this kind of reaction to everything mm-hmm. because he's trying to go fast. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Yeah. And so, um, but, yeah, I don't know. But that's that's it. You nailed it right on the head. And that's what I was trying to make is the point is like, okay, so now you got your top rider talking shit about the bike. Then he gets in trouble. So that's added onto his plate. He's got to win this SMX championship because he wants to prove to himself and the world that he can beat Jet because, dude, let's face it, Chase Sexton is fast as fuck. 
Mm-hmm. He's just oh, as yeah. fast as Jet on a good day, on Chase's good day. But Jet seems to have more shit together. But Chase could <coughs> beat him. Then you add on top of, you know, the championship, blah, 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 the money, all that shit. And then you add on top of that him getting a shitty start and Jet being out front and he sees it. So now he gets this panic because he knows he can't beat Jet if he can't be next to him. He's in fucking eighth, seventh place. It's the SMX championship triple points. He's looking at Jet. He don't even know what the fuck's going on. Cuts down, partial lands on him. Brrr, whole fucking season comes unraveled. <laughs> yeah. Um, welcome to motocross. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just like that. Right? Fuck. Welcome to motocross, my friends. Yeah, and that, that, and that could happen at the first race, too. You know? Yeah. And your whole season be done. So yeah. it's like that. That's what's the difference from motocross and any other sport is like you can, you know, it's like it's like everybody's on their last ride, last dime, last everything every time you ride. And that's what I explain to people that don't know motocross. I'm like, we risk we risk death every time we ride. Yes. You know, and that's yep. four times a week and one time on the weekend. And <laughs> it's day in and day out, weekend, week out, year in and year out. So you start to create a person that is different than most because when you can you when you can manage that understanding and that fear of that, you know, this could be your last ride. <clears throat> you know, everybody knows it. it. It takes one thing, one bike, one slip, one anything. Right. From the speeds that we're going there, we're going, but also, you know, we don't have this protection and also we have jumps and, <clears throat> and dirt and all these different things around us. So, you know, just that starts to create a kind of a, you know, a different entity, a different person, a different mind, you know, yeah. and it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know why I go there, but so, just, yeah, but Rhino, but you know, you know, for a fact, dude, none of these guys are thinking about that that is like we all no, know that no, no, it's no. a fact but it's so yeah i mean we're thinking about again, it but, but not but that, like but that i think shows, anybody that above that... 30 is thinking about it while racing <laughs> everybody below 30 is not <laughs> no the thing is is that it's, it's it's always in the back of your mind i don't care yes, anybody absolutely says. you know it's yes. always in the back of your mind we don't think about it but mm-hmm. sometimes it pops up and this and that you, you yeah. cannot, but that doesn't, that shows me that you're not a dumb person. That shows me that you're in a very, very intelligent person because you can manage that fear. You can manage that yes. thought. You can manage that, that, that scare yeah, where a lot of people can't, back your mind, you, a lot of people function. can't. And that's why they can't do it and don't do it because they're scared mm-hmm. yeah. because they can't overcome that. And it's not being stupid. It's being, it's being more of a master of yourself. Oh, and yeah. that's where I feel that motocrossers are looked at incorrectly like we're we're just dumb because we don't go to school and so no. much and this and that well how do you master something by doing two things it's impossible so you have to sacrifice something but what you become is a master of yourself like a master of your mind a master of your feel a master of your uh, surroundings you know what i mean mm-hmm. yep <clears throat> you know you can you can you can you can anticipate things faster than anybody like i've never seen a shitty uh, motocross rider that you know or shitty car driver car driver that rides a motocross you know yeah. you know all your motocross friends when you drive they're just so like good drivers right yeah like absolutely. we can we know shit that's coming up five cars ahead of us <laughs> yes yeah absolutely <laughs> right yep yes. yeah do we know i know i know what shit's gonna happen five cars ahead of me i know this guy's gonna do this this guy's gonna do that and i'm gonna scoot over here mm-hmm. right and then it happens bah, bah, bah. <laughs> so i don't know i just you know i think um you know we we kind of take uh take ourselves for granted a little bit, yeah. you know what I mean? Absolutely. And you guys know what it, what is it being at that level? Because things are happening faster than any sport. You know, like formula one, they can talk. You can't talk right in motocross, Fuck no no. Way. you know, no way. Not even, a, you could no way can you talk. And <laughs> then also, you know, Moto GP, Moto GP, you know, they stay, the conditions change, but only because of, of grip, nothing else. Yeah. Right. So that's all they have to worry about is grip. Our conditions change just like you guys were talking about at, at the, uh, you know, in at Dallas. Every yeah. single like moment. Crazy. Of fucking the- yes. Crazy. Yeah. So that takes a different athlete and a different mindset to be able to have control of his body and control of a motorcycle where formula one is control of the car moto gp is just lefts and rights we have to stand up come forward go backwards sit stand legs out you know mm-hmm. all these different things so yeah. we have so much more aware and you know we are so much more of aware of our surroundings in our in our body you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah. and so and also we have to be almost ahead of 
what those guys are because we have to initiate our body before we put the motorcycle there. Yeah. Right. Yes. Got to stay ahead. So it's like we're ahead of the we're ahead of these guys. I feel with our with our uh, you know kind of our approach or our you know movements. I guess. Yeah. You know, if that makes sense. So. It does. It definitely does. And I want to ask you one more question before we wrap this thing up. And I think, I think this topic is kind of, this is something that has become more and more and more relevant. And I'm not sure if it should be, or if it's because we're all prima donnas or because that's the (laughs) way of what's going on. And I'm sure you're going to think we're a prima donna. Um, but (laughs) We hear so much, Chase Sexton, the bike sucks. Jet Lawrence, um, we're going to have to go back with the team and have a team meeting after Texas. He gets second place. Um, We hear these new guys coming up, Brock Tickle, Trey Kennard, just strictly being a bike tester. The R&D that's going into Christian Craig's now getting hired at Star to be a test rider slash um, I guess Deegan's trainer, whatever you want to call it, but it's becoming more and more relevant. How much does it, how much should a rider really rely on the bike being perfect? And where is that balance? Like for Chase, it seems like he physically can't get over the fact that the bike isn't perfect, you know? And it's like, is it really coming down to the manufacturers having to have a bike that is that good, you know, or is it more the rider and the mindset that they have? And should they start having a mindset? Do we need riders that are tougher and we're just little pussy babies? I mean, I'm a victim of it, dude. I would go out and fucking change one click, two clicks and be like, Oh my God, that's the setting. And I would just ride and like, come on, dude, one or two (laughs) clicks is not, is not shouldn't make a fucking second difference. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess there's there's to me there's, there's here one yes that is very important the motorcycle because the motorcycles are very sensitive to change two pounds two clicks two millimeters you change that motorcycle and to an average rider no but to the higher level you go and the faster you go the more precise that that vehicle needs to be because you're on that that edge yeah. right so that but that, that motorcycle has to be one with you not feel feel like but, a, an orphan to you so but to speak. This is, now that's one thing so so the motorcycle does have a lot to do with it but on those guys best days they can run a bike that does not feel comfortable you know so some days are better than others so those those really good days so the day that let's say sexton came from last to whatever at hangtown mm-hmm. it didn't matter what if his bike was not good a little bit off or whatever it was the way he was riding Okay, yeah. so his technique yeah. was very open, sound, loose, flowing, you know, precise. His mind was free because he crashed in the first turn or whatever, so he had nothing to lose, right? Mm-hmm. And so you see this, you see this performance. But now I'm trying to protect something. I don't want this guy to beat me. Uh, everybody said that if it, if I don't win, you know, it's because of Jet. Well, now you start to ride maybe a little bit more tight, and now this bike feels a little bit... Uh, you know, subpar to you because now the bumps are becoming more, you're, you know, the you're, you're, you're pulling yourself up, you're rounding a little bit. You guys know as, as when you ride, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. And, and, and again, your, your best days, Hey, what would you, what were you thinking? I'm just, dude, I don't know. I, just, like, I just fucking feeling it, bro. Yeah. You know, just boom, boom, boom. And so it's, that's, you know, so that is, there's like three factors. There's one technique, you know, and that's going to be, when you're when you're confident you're going to be in that position we're talking about when you're unconfident you're going to round and tighten up a little bit right and then one is your mind are you are you are you afraid of failure or you you know in in the mindset of what if what could happen what if this happened you know if this happened you know you should be in that mindset of i'm gonna make it happen you know and so that and then also the bike yeah bike has to be set up and sometimes the bike could be a little bit stiff here or a little bit low here or this and that. And that's at that level. So, you know, it's, you know, I know I just, I just look at all different factors of it, you know what I mean? And not just like the sport is so kind of 
blinded to just it's that it's that it's that it's that it's like hold on wait a minute let's look at this let's look at the other side now look at look over here and then you might not look right there but that is a little bit of the cause but not the only cause does yeah. that make sense no i mean it makes so. sense but like so i was a test rider i was my job because i wasn't the fastest guy you know obviously in supercross but i was really really good with testing i could tell Mm -hmm. when one or two clicks made a difference but every oh, time yeah. every time they did that every time we'd go test a new shock spring a new uh you know test new valving test a couple clicks get the bike here every fucking time they changed a click on my bike i was like what the fuck i could tell this huge difference <laughs> but it it made yeah. me it made me really weigh on myself because i was like okay Adam, breathe for just a minute. Let's go out and try this for a couple motos, three motos, four motos, and get used to what that made the bike do. Because there were so many settings where it was like, wow, I hate this. Instantly. Like, I could fucking sit on my bike and I would know what the fuck you changed and be like, I fucking hate it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then you go and ride the bike... And you're realizing, because with motocross, there's a yin to the yang, no matter what the fuck you do. So you're making one yeah. thing better here, you're making it worse over here. 99% of the time, I felt like that was kind of what was going on. So I'd go out to the track. Yeah, and then, you know, the biggest thing is like, you don't, how do you know until you try? Yes. You know? So that was, when I tested, it was like, okay, put it on. Right away, I'd go, I would just go as fast as I could and and go okay that's my feeling and then i would ride maybe one more lap and kind of think about it you know what i mean yeah. yep and i kind of go okay ah, da, 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 da. yeah okay and then i put my feeling and my thought together and come in but i you know if i was the type of guy that would try anything you know what i mean not just because i changed a lot of stuff i didn't change a lot at all and some writers sensitive to other writers i don't think an rj hampshire is very sensitive he just fucking <laughs> uncorks it you know what i mean yeah. Where, you know, maybe a sexton is more sensitive to that. And also, you know, you're going to be a little bit maybe more sensitive to a steel chassis. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, there's there's different things. And again, um, you know, I know Honda's made a big a big improvement with their bike this year. Like this, the Clearly. 25 is like, whoa, Clearly. whoa, right here, you know, mm -hmm. like so damn stable. So, <clears throat> um, but I guess, know, I guess yeah, the point knows? that I was trying yeah. to make is like, when I would go test something and I hated it, you know, there was a better part of it. And then once I learned how to ride it after 20, 30 minutes, I could get back up to speed and really go, okay, this, what, this is what's going on. And I could feel it and get used to it and adapt to it. Right. Where, yeah. how I mean, much I've, I've do done these... that where, okay. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, how saying, much I, I, I could go, to... <laughs> go, 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 you go, bro. You go. <laughs> okay. So I was saying like, how much does Chase Sexton need to learn how to maybe just use his technique to adapt to the bike? These fucking guys, there's no way a setting with how fucking good Chase Sexton is. This guy is so good. There's no way he should be going from first by 15 seconds to fucking fifth the moto before by one clicker or two clicker change it's i'm yeah. sorry there's not that much of a difference i could see if he won by 15 seconds and then his bike was off and he got second or third but like it can't they're not messing the fucking bike up that much yeah no, and again, when your technique is sound, you know, you can get away with a lot more. And, you know, that's where I feel that with Jet, he can kind of ride through things, adapt to things because he's not, you know, he's, he's, he's patient, I think. He's, he's very, very, very patient. You know, he's very patient and when he acts, very patient. I've kind of never seen that before. It's like most people just go fast and if that's their fast, that's their fast. But he's like, you know, almost like more of a Tour de France kind of guy, like, you know, stay, stay. He stays in a peloton and then boom, one, one attack, yeah. you know, and then just, yeah. and then kind of just settles in where most people, but that shows confidence because he can, he can stay there, stay there, stay there, be patient and then have the confidence to attack, but then also have the confidence to stay 
with two seconds, three seconds and not panic where a lot of people that wouldn't be good enough. You know, that's like yeah. someone right on their ass and they're going to override and make a mistake because it's too close. You still can hear the guy. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. As, as you guys know, once, you know, cause that's why people try to pull and pull and pull. Cause once you got 10, 15, then it's like, ah, bap, 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 bap. you know, you're just, you're just <laughs> doing your gig, you know, but yep. you know, when that guy's yeah. on your ass, you're just you know, on your ass. It's like, to be able to relax in that position, yeah. To be in a relax in that position takes, you know, takes trust. Yes. Yes. So he's patient, he's confident, and he trusts in himself, right? He trusts in his his ability, mm-hmm. and that's that's why, you know, he can do that. That's where Chase maybe has a little bit more of a panic, a little bit more of a questioning. Maybe he doesn't truly trust himself racing against uh, if he's fast enough against Jet. Yep. Right. Agreed. Yeah. And that, 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 and that, and again, your mind controls your body. You know, I've never seen an angry person just laid back, you know, f- you know, kind of cruising, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, however no, your mind true. is, your body. I mean, gonna, that's the realest fucking shit I've heard in a while right there. I mean, yeah, come on. You know? Yeah. Your mind is, your, your body's just, your body's just a slave to your mind because how, whatever your mind says, your body does. Just like if you want to, you didn't like yourself, you want to jump off a bridge, your body would do it. Cool. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Your yep. your body's your best, uh, yeah. It's um, you know, your best employee ever. <laughs> it, it's wild when right? you just think it's about your best, it. Your best servant. Yeah, it's and, your best servant you'll ever find. And you, you get reminded, I mean? reminded of how simple, how complex, but yet how simple that relationship is. Yeah, yeah, it truly is. So uh, cool. But yeah, that that's kind of how I see see things, and maybe I see it in a different way. But uh, yeah, it's just me, man. Cool. Well, Rhino. Holy fucking shit, that was awesome. I'm uh I'm glad we got to have a really cool conversation. Thank you so much for staying yeah, on for no, thank you guys for 90 minutes. We'd love to have you on again. <laughs> um I don't Yeah, no problem, man. I don't know when, but we'll definitely get you on more often. I love your perspective yeah. on things. So um Rhino, yeah. track yeah, well, first track talkers episode, but not yeah. the last. <laughs> No way, buddy. Yeah, let's let's do it again. And uh, again, keep doing what you guys do and be in a voice. And, you know, like I say, just also being you guys. Don't 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 fit in. You know, <laughs> yeah. the worst thing that this world needs right now is someone that fits in. You know, we oh, need God. people that are off. Yes. Makes one of a kind. Yes. Life does not make duplicates. <clears throat> and everybody's trying to be a duplicate to fit in so they can save this check and protect this job and and keep this, you know, imaginary persona. Like, do you, man? Do you? And Hell yeah. that, that's, you know, that authenticness is what this world needs because it doesn't have any juice to it anymore. And being authentic is juicy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, Hell yes, I know what it, you're dude. talking keep about, it. my guy. I preach, Dude, that <laughs> puts it. such a big smile on my face. That's so badass coming from you. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to, man. You have to, so. Cool. Well, awesome, guys. Well, have a good night. I'm going to go eat some dinner and then... uh I will. I'm sure I'll see you down the street or, or talk to you down the road. Heck hey, yeah. Sounds, sounds good. good. Thanks, Rhino. All right, buddy. Peace. Hey, take care. Yep. Later. Bye. Bye. Ooh. Bro. <laughs> Dude, Rhino is a legend. Bro, Rhino is a lot. He's in a, a in a good way. He has so much knowledge and just so much thought on motocross. Like I don't think I've I've met an older retired rider that has so much in depth like knowledge on motocross and what I I mean it sounds like he watches a lot of super motocross and a lot of motocross still. Yeah. I mean without a doubt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. More than most. Yeah, because the key word that he used um that I thought was very interesting when he talked about Feld was passion. And I think that's really what Rhino has is like a true, deep passion for the sport. And that's yeah. why he's become who he is and a mentor to so many riders and so many different people is because he has true fire and passion. And you know, just ending that conversation, I really appreciate him saying that. And I want to say, I want to say this too, as well to Rhino is like, dude, you apologized at the beginning for 
it wasn't even apology, but he's like, some people might not like me because of the way I live or what I do or how I think, you know, with nature and stuff like that. No, fuck that, bro. Don't apologize or even put that shit out. That's why we all love you. That's why we follow you. That's why we listen to you is because you don't have that same perspective. You are not a duplicate, yeah. you know, and that's why we love Rhino. And yeah, he might be an acquired taste. Yes. He's that like, if you can look past Rhino and just listen to what he says and apply what he says in his Instagram videos or his DVD series that we have both watched at a younger age. Yeah. Like, he knows what the fuck he's talking about. And if you don't understand, then you're not at a level to understand what he's talking about. Yeah, and I want to remind all the listeners, too, when have you ever met anybody that is doing something at a severely high level that you can truly relate to. Never. Very few. Very, very few. There is normal when it comes to being the best. They don't go together. And that's why you meet people like that. That's why there's the Rhinos and the Ken Roxons and the Jet Lawrences and the Chase Sextons and all those guys and Lady Gaga and Machine Gun Kelly and, uh, you know, Donald Trump, whatever you <laughs> want to call it. Whatever you want to call it. out misfits now. What, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Freaking Obama, okay? Let's, let's hit both sides of the party, okay? Whatever you want to call it, they're special people that think a special way that do more than what is required of them. Yes, this is very Whether true. you agree or disagree with whatever they do, they don't have normal in them. And bringing back to that, Super Mario Cross, I can't believe it's fucking over, dude. <laughs> but we do have MX and Nations. We got MX and Nations. We got Oz X Open. We got some European races that we can, we're going to follow. And we have World Supercross, right? And... We are not going to stop all the way until January, folks. And new episodes coming to you every week. This is 24-7 motocross. We ain't no bitch-ass any other media fucking partners where we 24 stop 24-7! Because we have enough stuff to talk about in the off-season. Absolutely. Yes, we do. And I, That's one thing. It's talking about off-season. I kind of wanted to... I, I had a question for him. But then I totally blanked on it, and I wanted to talk to him if he was training Austin Forkner in 2025 and if he's going to Triumph. Oh, shit. We didn't even talk about that. Dude, it was Rhino. Dude, I have never met someone that could out-talk me. <laughs> <laughs> Rhino was on it. Bro. I, I loved a, it. A lot of people will talk more if you don't talk over them. Yeah, I know, but Rhino did not care. <laughs> Rhino wanted to say his shit. Yes. That was sick. Yes. He had some points to get across, and he was like, no, dude, 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 you're going to shut the fuck up right now, dog. I'm way older than you, and I'll come over and whoop your ass barefoot, dude. Yeah, barefoot, grounded, motherfucker. Oh, and we we couldn't even got into him like, the kettlebell because our old trainer, Doug Nepardal, trained him on kettlebells way back in the day. So that's why we got to – dude – Rhino might be the guy to have on every episode in Supercross. Just have him on as like a co-co star. Just get him on over the weekend. Yep, get him on, get him off. Fuck it. Give him a 20-minute, 15-minute seg yeah. on Track Talkers all you year go hard next year. With Rhino. Yep. Rhino segment. Mm-hmm. That might be lit. We might have to get that in the works. Episode 26 of Track Talkers brought to you by the world's best sprockets, dirt tricks, three to 500 hours made in the United States of America. What? Voted the best sprocket. What? In 2023 by the people. What? You've got to be kidding me. If you don't have a dirt trick sprocket, you are messing up. What? You thought I was going to go... Um, 
Ricky Bobby on you and said you, but I didn't. Um, it, Potentially, I'll do it anyway. this sprocket could last 10,000 hours. If you, <laughs> if you don't get out of first gear. <laughs> I was about to say that, but you could even get into fifth and it might last 10,000. If you sprocket. bog it. Bog and it. depending on your conditions. Yep. If you don't ride a lot of rocks, it could last you 10,000 hours. And you know what? Thank you to all the audience because, dude, we've been selling some Dirt Trick sprockets. Have we been? Yeah, and people are like... Really liking them. We're getting Bro, good reviews. Keep on using that discount code because we need the help. I want to be able to do this 24-7, dude. Track Talkers 25, <laughs> okay? Next guy on the list, no lean suspension. Do you want 10% off? Well, mention Track Talkers to Clark Jones. Go to the website right here, call him on the phone, and say, yo, Clark, I want my suspension done on my brand new 450. I want to be floating on baby ducks at the track. Give me 10% off because I mentioned track talkers. And he'll be like, heck yeah, I will. Hey, a special announcement. No baby ducks were hurt in this episode of Track Talkers. <laughs> <laughs> no baby ducks were hurt in this episode. Um, yeah, I mean, that's episode 26. What a fantastic episode. Definitely one of those episodes I'm going to have to rewatch. To kind of get all the little... To soak in all that knowledge. To soak in all that knowledge. But I am serious. If you if you search Ryan... I, I think Rhino Power... I think some people um, have some of the old Rhino Power DVDs on YouTube. Uh-huh. You should go watch them. There's some good shit in there. And they were made back in like 2000. I remember watching the Rhino one about concrete starts. I was about to, I was going to tell him that I learned how to do concrete starts from Rhino Power. Boom. Boom. And if you guys, here's a little tip that I learned from Rick Johnson before we close out this episode. Ooh. But, RJ? So Rhino, Ryan Hughes was talking about how important structure is with your body. Mm -hmm. What I want you guys to do is go at home, lay down, get in the push-up position, okay? And I want you guys to get one inch from the ground with your elbows bent, okay? Then I want you to get in the push-up position and put your elbows and get your shoulders back like this and see which one's easier to stay in that position. Is it easier to stay one inch from the ground with your elbows tucked down and your shoulders down or is it easier to keep your elbows straight back, get your shoulders down in that right tuck position, and hold yourself up? And that's how important it is to keep those legs more straight, bend at the hips, and have good body structure. Good body structure is so important to being strong. So important. And give it a shot. Episode 26. Thanks for listening. You guys are the best. Keep like, commenting, and subscribing to Track Talkers. Tell your friends. Share us online. Peace. We'll see you guys next week.